Lords of War. Chapter 4, Unto the Anvil of War. Slim A. Lu Prime. Pain is an illusion of the senses, fear an illusion of the mind, beyond these only death awaits as a silent judge or all, mortarion primarch of the death guard. Naomi had been alone for a month in that freezer, unable to feel anything, hear anything. She thought her mouth was open but again her hands were tied down and she could not feel anything. She thought that thing had come in a few times, but she was unsure. She tried to call out to him but with her missing all senses she had no idea if she was even speaking words or just making noises. Even so, he made no gesture to acknowledge her. He would walk out and shut the door, the light would turn off soon after. This went on and on and on. She could not sleep nor could she think straight. She was starving for a feeling, anything, even pain. Just something that would let her feel again. She wanted someone to speak to her, to hold her, to tell her everything would be okay. Where was Artemis? Where was her goddess when she needed her? Why was she taking so long? Did she even know she was gone, there were so many in the hunt, could it be that she had forgotten about her? The only comfort she had in these moments was the man who kept her hostage. Throughout these days of nothingness, he was the light at the end of the tunnel. Whenever he was near she could have sworn she began to feel something. Naomi could almost feel her heart flutter when he got near. After a month passed, she began to crave his presence more than anything. If only he would spend more time in the freezer, more time with her, she would feel better. He was the key to happiness that she had to have. If only he would undo these chains so that she might run to him stand in the brilliant light that was him. She would give anything to be next to him. The door to the freezer opened. Her head lifted up so that she might see the light that was that man. Oh, if only she could know his name. Instead of walking off to the side of the freezer he came right to her. She began to feel her heartbeat again and something reminiscent of a smile come to her face. He pulled up a chair and sat down. He took out an injector and inserted it into the side of Naomi's neck. As if he breathed life back into her body she began to feel again. She began to feel again, the cold against her skin, the hunger in her stomach. Then he spoke. Well, you're still alive, granted this was my first time having a subject still alive after I injected them with one of my chemical concoctions, and they didn't outright die. Still under the effects of drugs so Naomi was still unable to talk choosing to just stare at him in a clueless manner. You still seem to be suffering from the effects of the drug. Using you as a basis I can modify the duration and the effects of the concoction, as long as I take the kind of subject into effect. Normally being treated as a lab rat one would feel some resentment towards said person experimenting on them. However, having no human contact other than the man before her, Naomi felt as though she was being pampered. Here he was focusing on her, nothing else mattered at the moment. That goddess never gave her this much attention except the time she made the foolish decision of joining her. I apologize if this seems cruel, what I am doing, but I require information about the being who was similar to me. If your leader had given me the information then none of this would have happened. For this I am sorry. Sorry? Why would he be sorry? She had never felt better. Naomi thought to herself, still being unable to speak. However she managed to get out a type of groan. Once the effects have gone down a bit more. I will ask you questions about the individual you and your group encountered. If you answer all my questions truthfully, then no harm will come to you, that I promise. He cared about her, like she always knew he did. She managed a weak smile, the sides of her mouth turning ever so slightly upward. Not wanting to disappoint him she tried to speak using all of her willpower to do so. W what, do y, u, w a n, t two, no. Naomi managed to get out. This individual, the one your leader said was similar to me, how did you and your group meet him? The man asked leaning forward slightly wanting to make sure he heard every word. T h a t g goddess came, across one, like, you during, one of, h er hunts in Montana. However, when she, went to speak, with him, we found H, him missing. We, have been trying, to track him down, for some, time now. Can you give me a description of him? He, was slightly taller, 
the new, blonding hair, and wolfish ice blue eyes. She replied. The man paused for a moment as if listening to someone else. Where did your goddess first come across him? And any leads on what direction he may have gone? He asked. Her face fell a little, she did not know what to displease him. Only my, former leader and her, L. Lieutenant know any details when it comes to, leads. But the rest of us think he is moving randomly as if he is looking, for something that he doesn't, know where it is. The man's face held a neutral look, then closed his eyes as if he was in deep thought. Seeing his discouragement she quickly spoke up. I, I can help you find Hi, him. And how can you help me? I am a good hunter, I can help you, track him. And what makes you think you can track him when your goddess and the other hunters could not? She looked down. She was guiding us, you seem to know him, if you guide me then it might be different. Well I don't have very many choices left, very well. A half smile creeped into her face, it would have been a full smile if it had not been for the fact that she was still somewhat sedated. Before we head out, I must create an antidote to the serum that is still affecting your senses. It will take some time so the best thing for you is to rest, perhaps in an actual bed. Jack stood up and began to undo the hunter's chains before picking her up bridal style and exiting the freezer. As soon as he stepped out of the freezer, the man dropped her and a massive scythe appeared in his hand and effortlessly he swung the massive weapon cutting the incoming weapon in two. A broken arrow sat at his feet, one with a silver arrow head. Hum and here I thought I had a bit more time before more of you showed up. From the second level of the warehouse stepped out a girl about twelve years old in appearance. She had a very pissed off expression on her face. Other girls appeared all around the warehouse all wearing similar clothes and wielded similar weapons. Boy, you attacked my hunters. The goddess said angrily. Normally I would turn you into a jackalope and have my hunters hunt you. But you are connected to another boy I have been looking for so you are going tell me what you know and I will kill you now. The man stood silent there for a few seconds until his chest started to shake. Suddenly the sound of laughter ranged out from the man till it got louder and louder. Then as quick as it started, it ended. How humorous that you threatened me when I defended myself from your hunters when they attempted to attack me. I do not wish to have ill relations with you and your hunters. Then you should have come quietly when you had the chance. You hunters threatened to shoot me if I did not come, I wasn't given a choice so I responded accordingly. We both have the same goal in mind, it would be better to end this pointless squabble and work together. I disagree, I only need your information not you. I would have let you go if you would have surrendered but you attacked my hunters. That is a crime I cannot forgive. The goddess said, knocking an arrow and aiming at the man. I see, it's a shame that things could not be resolved peacefully, no matter, I have stalled long enough. What? You see, since the start of this conversation, I released a colorless, odorless knockout gas that has slowly begun to fill up the entire warehouse in case negotiations went south. Artemis looked around, sure enough her hunters were falling over. The sound of the man's side's point hitting the ground drew her attention back to him. And this gas I made is quite flammable, but don't worry they will all burn in their sleep. They will not feel a thing. I call it, the eternal sleep. So you have two choices, either you allow me and the girl to escape, or you can fight me and risk all your hunters burning to death, your move girl. The goddess fixed him with a strong gaze. This is not over, boy. Knowing he had won the man smiled and picked up the now unconscious girl. I know. But by the time we meet again I will not be alone. The male said making his way over to a side exit. The goddess's eyes tracked him all the way. This was far from over. Leon kept watch while the other three slept. Seeing as he did not need much sleep to function for weeks on end without any sleep. There was also the fact that he was the strongest of them, he could kill any monster that might find them. Since joining them he has killed many monsters as they almost seemed to be attracted to them. At least it gave him something to do, and killing monsters did give him a feeling of purpose. His other self was less than talkative with him at the moment, less so than normal. He was against the idea of coming with these kids but after Leon made the decision to follow them the lion did not bring it up again since.
the girl called to Leah, talked to him the most, Annabeth tuned in whenever she found their topic of conversation to be interesting. Luck might join in sometimes but overall he was still wary of him. Leon was brought out of his thoughts when he heard someone enter the old building they were staying in. He took a quick sniff of the air around him, he could smell the three behind him just fine but he also caught the smell of a goat. The still-growing Primarch stood and went to investigate. He activated one of his psycho abilities to make creatures unable to perceive him. In layman's terms he turned himself invisible. Leon made his way to the entrance where he saw a boy looking around. However, as it would turn out this boy had the legs of a goat. The creature itself was white-skinned with curly brown hair, brown eyes, small horns, and a wispy beard. It looked somewhat afraid, its head quickly darling around the room while sniffing the air. The creature also seemed to be looking around for something, Leon had an idea what. However, this creature did not look like much of a threat given its size and rather lacking muscular structure. There was also a lack of weapons on the creature's person, though it could mean that this creature did not need weapons as it could make use of psychic abilities. However, the creature did not seem to have psychic abilities as he could almost sense these things in people. The reading he was giving off was not that of a psychic. Leon walked up to the creature, completely unaware of the danger it was in. Leon followed close behind him wanting to see what he would do. As it turns out the creature made his way to the rest of the group. A smile came to its face as it saw the other three. It was about to run over to them when he found a large hand holding his shoulder and something sharp at this throat. It let out a shriek of surprise, waking the others from their sleep. They all jumped to their feet and drew their own weapons. Their eyes fell on the creature who was looking very scared. Leon revealed himself just before they were about to speak, his massive sword at the creature's neck. Wait wait. I'm not here to hurt you guys. The creator cried out tariffed. You are all demigods right. I am here to help, I swear. The others looked to each other, a silent conversation being asked. When they got their answer they turned back to the creature. Let's hear him out. Talia said before looking at Leon. You can let him go. His other self, let out a ping of annoyance that a child was ordering him. Leon ignored it and removed his sword from the creature's throat. The large human then pushed the creature forward causing it to stumble. It looked back at him but saw nothing but the silent judgment of the shadowy face of Leon. It looked over to Talia. Thanks. Don't thank me yet. Talia replied, crossing her arms. For all we know you're a monster leading us into a trap. The creature adopted a novorous smile. Well it's a good thing I'm not a monster. I'm a satyrs, we are guides for demigods like you guys and, he turned his head to look at Leon. You, I guess, I have never seen a demigod as big as you. I'm not a demigod. Lun replied not missing a beat. Oh, then what are you? Private. Leon answered projecting some of his ammonus aura. It stumbled back. All right all right cool, that's cool. He turned back around to the others. Well I guess I should introduce myself, my name is Grover Underwood and like I said I am a satyr. I am supposed to help you guys to get Camp Half of Blood, a place where you'll be safe from monsters. The others looked at each other liking the sound of a safe place from the monsters. Oddly enough his other self seemed to approve of the idea for some reason. Leon sent a ping of inquiry to him. To his surprise he answered. It is simple they will be safe thus no longer need of our protection. We cannot watch over them forever, we have our own makings to fulfill. The lion answered. Help them there if you must but then we must leave them. That's not up to you. Leon replied. Maybe but you will understand once they are among their own kind. Our place is out there with our siblings, there seems to be this camp. What if I don't understand, what if I want to stay with them? At that moment something began to take shape in front of him. A man two heads taller than him, wearing proper green power armor. On one of his poldons was his legion's heraldry, a downward-facing sword with wings his chest plate having an engraving of the upper portion of a silver lion's head biting down on some unseen prey. His face was covered by his winged helmet. 
Do not forget yourself young knight. The lion spoke as if disciplining a child. You are a weapon now, created to serve humanity as a whole. You cannot protect a small part of it just because you feel some kinship with them. They are different from normal humans, yes, the similarities end there. You are a primarch, act like it. He finished and disappeared. Leon, hey Leon you there? While Leon and his other self were speaking, Grover was speaking with the others. Talia was standing in front of him giving him an odd look. Leon moved his head to look at her causing her to lose the look she had and return to normal one. We talked and the rest of us want to go to this camp. Talia informed him. Are you still willing to come with us? Leon thought over his other self's words. He did feel kinship with these three, they were like him, different, he did not belong nor did they. When he met them and found they were like him he was so happy to finally be able to find some people he could connect with. He did not want to run away from that. I will assist you in reaching this camp. Leon replied. A large smile appeared on Talia's face, and though she could not see it Leon was smiling too. Since everyone was up at this time it was decided that they start making their way towards this camp half-blood. However, as it would come to be, Grover was a very poor guide as he lost his way on more than one occasion. Going as far as having the group walking in circles for a day or two, on a few actions leading them right into a horde of monsters. Annabeth was almost turned into a stew by a giant. Luckily Luke had been able to save her from that, while Lun and Thyla were fighting off monsters. However, as time went on Leon began to notice a recurring theme in Luke. He always seemed to want to throw himself at any monster that they came across. It seemed to Leon that he was starting to become the reason they were making a lot of wrong turns. Talia also seemed to be catching on as well. After a few more days of endless wondering, Leon asked Grover where Camp Half-Blood was located. He answered saying it was on Long Island and reassured the Primarch that they were getting there. However, Leon was unconvinced and took the lead of the group needless to say they reached Long Island a few days later. As the world would have it they were already being followed by another horde of monsters hellhounds, manticores, giant monsters, harpies, you name it, it was probably chasing the group. Seeing as the number of monsters would overwhelm them Leon came to a stop from his jog. The others kept running towards the hill where Crover claimed the camp was. Talia was the first to notice Leon had stopped and came to a stop too. She told him to keep running but Leon did not heed her words. Instead he turned and faced the oncoming horde and took a ready since with his lion sword up ready to spill the blood of its master's enemies. Leon did however turn his head to look at here, and for a brief moment Thyla beheld her friend's face. A somewhat pale white skin with long flowing blonde hair and surprisingly gentle green eyes. A ever so small smile appeared on his face. In that moment she knew he would be fine, after all he was able to kill any monster they came across with ease. Why would a horde of the things make any difference, if anything they were holding him back? Talia grinded her teeth together before turning and running. But before she did she ordered him to come back to her alive. Leon replied with an ever so slight nod before his face became mashed in darkness. Leon ran to meet the monster horde. Once in range of his great sword, Leon swung it in a wide slightly upturned arch. In one swing of his sword five monsters met their end, their heads split in two across their face. A swift knee to another monster's face ended its life and a punch ended another. As his hearts began to beat faster, the monster began to slow down for Leon as they were moving in slow motion. Yet Leon was still moving at normal speed. A hellhound jumped over Leon only to have the Primarch grab its tail and use it to beat other monsters to death before crushing its head with his foot. His fist found its way into a giant's gut causing the monster to kneel down, crushing its stomach. As soon as its knees hit the ground the giant found its head falling down from his shoulders. Another wide swipe with Leon's lion sword claimed another five monsters and the Primarch was only getting faster. To any onlooker he was a blur of green motion, every and any monster to come close to the blur was cut down. It was almost like they were willingly walking into a green blender turning them into chunks of meat before they turned into golden dust. But even in the blur of motion there is not one misstep or a strike that was sloppy. Even at such speed he fought like a dancer, every move led seamlessly into another. 
It was a dance of such grace and skill that few could ever hope to match. He was like a vengeful war god coming down to strike down all foul monsters in his presence, not one would get past him while he stood. And as the dance was about to reach its climax, it ended. The last monster lay slain and turned into golden dust. Leon stood to his full height looking over the dust that used to be terrifying monsters, now nothing more than dust underneath his boots. For the first time in a long time Leon had, fun. It had been so long since he had let loose and let his instincts take over him. It felt so natural so right to slay so many monsters. To protect those who would have died against such a horde. You are a weapon. The lion spoke. You are a weapon in service to humanity, it is only natural that you feel this way when you act as you were intended to be. Even if Leon did not want to argue, he knew he was right. He was a weapon, plain and simple. He felt gratified slaying those monsters. He turned to look up the hill. The others reached the top and they were looking down at him in amazement and wonder. However, they were not alone. There were more kids, a lot of them sharing similar traits to others. Offspring of the same parent but not of the same parents. They looked at him differently. Fear, cautious, jealousness, lust, and disdain. The lion's words rang in his ears again. He did not belong there, sure the others had grown to accept him but he was not like them. He did not belong there. He belonged out there with his siblings, wherever they may be. He belonged on the battlefield not in a camp made for the spawn of some unimportant gods. As he stood there he noted Talia's face was starting to become worried. He won but he was not walking up to meet her and the rest of them. He had a feeling she was beginning to figure out what he was thinking. His mask of darkness fell for all to see. Take care of yourself. Leon whispered yet he knew Talia heard him. He turned and began to run down the hill. Leon. Talia cried out to him yet it fell on deaf ears. The up-and-coming Primarch ran faster knowing the more he heard her voice the more his will to leave would shake. The others began to cry out to him. Leon, where are you going? Annabeth demanded thought worried. Leon, what gives? Luke called confused. Luckily for Leon a few more monsters came out of the forest coming straight for him. It gave Leon something to focus on rather than the voices the others. He easily cut through them with his great sword and the ones that followed but the Primarch never slowed down for any of them. As such he ran over a few, their small bodies crushed under his weight. The Primarch only slowed down then their voices were out of earshot, and for him that was quite a distance. He fell to his knees as if the weight of the world was now on his shoulders, yet he did not shed a tear. There he was alone again, no one to call friends or speak with. Just him and his other self. His ears twitch at the sound of a low growing noise. Around him dozens upon dozens of hellhounds were surrounding him. One brave one charged at him, jumping and baring his sharp teeth as soon as it was within range. Just as Leon was about to dispatch the pest, a huge hammer came flying out of the forest and slammed into the monster. The force behind the hammer easily overpowered the hellhound taking it flying with it on its current trajectory. The hammer slammed into a tree blowing past it and into a group of hellhound killing them all outright. Leon turned towards the hammer's origin and saw something large with blood-red eyes coming towards him. As it stepped into the moonlight Lund saw the being that threw the hammer. He was large, slightly larger and taller than him. He wore green armor with golden accents. The leg armor held scale-styled engravings. The left kneecap had the Roman numeral 8 upon them the number 18 if he remember correctly. His shoulder pads were black with the right one having the upper skull of some dragon-like creature. His chest pieces were covered in some form of ornaments, their meaning Leon had no idea. He also had a cape that looked to be skinned right off the scales of some large dragon-like creature. Then there was his skin. It was black, but not like a normal black man that looked more brown than black. His skin was an unnatural oil black and his eyes were a glowing bright red as if he was from the deepest part of hell in Mainable. A deep joyous laugh filled the air as the man looked down at Leon. My dear little brother it is so good to see you again, come give your brother a hug. The giant man said as he outstretched his arms, only for another hellhound to jump at him. 
Oh dear this little mutt would like to play? The man boisterously laughed as he backhanded the hellhound crushing its skull into a fine golden mist before a burst of promethium flame, engulfed the rest of the body from the flamer under his arm. It looks like we will have to save the joyous hug for after we deal with these doggos who knows maybe we can make some into the best of friends, or help them along their way to the grave Ari brother. With that the man rushed past Leon to where his hammer was resting in the golden dust of the monsters grabbing the hilt he brought it up then, smashing down onto the body of another hellhound faster than Leon could track as a crackle of thunder reverberated from the hammer's head. What are you doing standing there brother, come fight let us remember the good times. The man shouted as he kept on laughing, igniting the trees and monsters around him. Lun took his great sword and joined his brother in battling the hellhounds. With the two giants fighting together they quickly made short work of the gathered monsters. After the last monster turned into dust Leon let his sword stance drop, he turned to face his supposed sibling only to be picked up and brought into a spine-breaking hug. It is so good to see you, my how big you have grown and still grumpy as ever. The man laughed, swinging him back and forth. Now let's see blonde hair, green eyes, a stern stare and an edgy ego. You must be the little lion oh how good it is to see you again, with the hood I thought you were mortar iron, the man said crushing Leon harder, then again you didn't have a scythe always hated that weapon. He muttered finally dropping his younger brother. Leon hit the ground coughing as his lungs were suddenly able to breath again. His makeshift armor was dented inward from the death hug he had just received making it uncomfortable to stand in. How do you know his name? Leon managed to say. He has no memory of his siblings, yet you seem to. Oh dear look at that armor, most horrible brother, I will have to fix that immediately, but for your question. Of course I would remember all my brothers, they were the most dear to me. After all we all have a part of our father in us. I was his humanity. He said looking down at Leon's chest armor. I am surprised that he doesn't remember my hugs, well I could always do it again and squeeze the memories out. He said as he started to reach down again to hug Leon. Not wanting to suffer another death hug Leon rolled away. Look, let's give me some space here. Just who are you? You know me but I don't know you. Why my dear little brother I always took you as the one that knew everything, well what was going on that is. Oh well I guess I must teach the little cub. The man said Bosterius. You may call me Forge or as I am in my more primarch self, Vulcan, Forge father of Nocturne. Vulcan stated joyously. Picking up his huge storm hammer that he had set down by his side when he went to hug Leon. Besides Leon his other self began to take shape, his helmet still on his head. If you are one of my siblings then show some restraint for a moment. I sense we are being watched. Let us speak to someone else from prying eyes. The lion suggested getting the forged way. My dear little lion there you are, look at you all ghost-like, aren't you funny? And yet you still don't remember me that sure does explain why you can't summon his full armor yet. The man said laughing before it suddenly stopped. But enough of this I must agree with you my brooder we should leave at once. Or we could call out to the little ones hiding and watching us. With that he walked over to the place he came out from reaching down he grabbed a massive rucksack, before placing it over his shoulder with a heavy clinking sound. We should go now. Forge said. However just as they were about to leave a symbol of fiery hammer appeared over his head. Meanwhile. Upon the mystical Mount Olympus, the major gods of the Greek pantheon sat in the council hall. Each one sitting upon their own thrones looking different from the last, every eye was upon the imagined being shown in the center of the room. There a giant of a man fought a horde of monsters single-handedly with a speed that no demigod could match. Being gods, they were able to track the movements of the giant. Only one of the gods was excited by the spectacle going on. That god being the war god Ars who was showing his enjoyment by a single world of approval, or the twitch of his body as if it were dodging some weapon. The gods watched on as he killed the last monster and as he turned and the shadows hiding his face rolled back. Dibs. Aphrodite called for all to hear. Dibs? What do you mean dibs? Demeter asked, confused. Dibs, he's mine. Dibs, look I just claimed him again. Aphrodite added. You mean to say that he is yours? 
If so then why not claim him normally? Demeter countered. Oh I was claiming him for something else. Aphrodite said smugly. Demeter blushed. Why, you cannot claim like that, you need to get to know him. You cannot simply just say he's yours. Sure I can. Dips, there I did it again. Both of you quite, he's moving. Poseidon interrupted. Just as he said the giant was on the move again running away from the camp while the three that came with him called out to him. All the gods began to wonder why he was running, after all he was a hero. Yet he did, cutting down a few monsters that were late to the slaughter. He ran for a few miles before coming to a stop and falling to his knees. There he need for a few moments before a large pack of hellhounds made themselves know. As one ran at him, the gods watched on as a huge hammer came in flying out of the woods killing the hellhound and another group of them along the hammer's trajectory. That's when another giant made himself known. This one being larger and in greener armor. The giant laughed and greeted the slightly smaller giant as brother. Seeing the new threat another hellhound ran to attack the giant only for him to backhand the monster killing it in an instant. After another set of words the two began to clear out the rest of the hellhounds. A task that only lasted a few minutes at most. As the two fought one of the gods suddenly took a much greater interest than he normally would during such meetings. Something one of the more observant goddesses noticed. Hephaestus. Athena called over to the forging god. When he turned his head to look at her she continued. You seem to know the larger one, care to share with the rest of us? Hephaestus looked around the room for a moment to find every god was looking at him. One more so than the others. The forge got let go of a growling sigh. I know of him, yes. He is mine. That got the other god's attention. Well it seems you finally made a good fighter. Ars commented. Who did you fuck her? She must have been you hell of a fighter if you created that thing with her. Might visit her myself. Hephaestus shot the war god a glare. Whatever retort Hephaestus was going to say was interrupted when Hermes called to the rest of the gods. Hey, they're talking again. The jolly green giant greeted the one called Leon again this time pulling him into a hold that made some of the gods wince as the power, behind said a hug. The larger giant made some observations about the smaller one. However it was when he mentioned another one of his siblings' weapons that one of the gods started to get angry. Being reminded of a certain event involving another giant. When the oil black skinned giant dropped the smaller one, he began to ask how he knew someone else's name oddly enough. The larger giant commented on the state of the smaller one's damaged makeshift armor, before answering that he was able to remember because he had his father's humanity. That earned the forge god a quick stare from the others. What does he mean? He has your humanity. Zeus demanded. Hephaestus was trying to think up an answer when the larger giant went in for another hug. Leon rolled away from his so-called brother and demanded to know who he was. Silence filled the room when the larger giant named himself Forge and that in his, Primarch, self was called Vulcan, Forge father of Nocturne. It's that what he meant. Zeus demanded standing from his throne. Why did you give him your Roman god portion? Do you know how dangerous that makes him? Hephaestus began to panic internally. He honestly did not know how to answer Zeus in a satisfactory way. He did not have a silver tongue like Apollo nor was he smart like Athena. It was the main reason he did not talk much, if ever, during these meetings. He knew if he turned into his Roman self he would denounce his son as he was his Greek self's son and not his Roman self. He waited for a moment hoping one of the other gods might bust him out of this bad situation. When none of them did, he began to sweat as he thought of an excuse. Well. Zeus demanded getting closer to the forge god. H, he does not have my Roman self. I, it's just a title he came up with. Hephaestus replied sheepishly. Zeus growled. Swear on the river Styx. The forge god did as such. Thunder sounded in the distance, when nothing happened to the forge god Zeus calmed down and sat back down in his throne. Claim your son. Zeus ordered and Hephaestus did so. After such the two giants began to move going back into the forest. 
soon after the two disappeared into air as if they were never there. Where did they go? Hera asked looking closer at the image. Do, no. Apollo answered. I can't seem to find them anymore. Where could they have gone? Zeus asked, to which Apollo shrugged. The other gods began to talk among themselves. However, Apollo took notice of his sister's mood. Hey little sis, what's up? You look like I just flirted with one of your hunters. Apollo asked smugly. Artemis gave him said death glare. Yeah, that's the one. Artemis groaned. It's none of your concern brother. Come on. I can help you, you can always count on me. I do not want your help, brother. I do not need it, I can handle them myself. Them? Apollo got low and started to whisper. Like those two or others like them? Artemis silently cursed herself for letting go of that little bit of information. Like I said it's none of your concern. Will dad think the same way? Apollo whispered back casually. The threat did not go over the hunt goddess head. She growled at him before speaking. Yes there are more like them, I have come across two. One owes me for saving him and the other kidnapped one of my hunters. Oh so the second one got away? Apollo asked, surprised. It's not like you to let your prey get away. He has not gotten away. Artemis hissed. I am still hunting him down, the only reason I am here is because father called us here. If not I would be hunting him down. I think I can help. I don't need your help. But I really think I can help. Artemis growled knowing that he was not going to give up until she agreed. Fine. Yes. Apollo called doing a little dance on his throne. When do we leave? Now.